<clears throat> bones. So we finished up talking about some of bone formation. Um, where did I leave off? bone formation, bone resorption, and we talked about Paget's disease. So now we're gonna actually get in and talk uh, a, a bit about um, how the bones form. So let's start off with the microscopic anatomy. And again, just to get a quick reminder, right? Bone is supporting connective tissue which means we're going to be discussing the components of that connective tissue, which is going to be cells and extracellular matrix. So we've already discussed the cells, the generator cells, osteoblasts, osteocytes, and osteoclasts. Okay, so we're going to continue on with that in a little bit more uh, detail, but I want to talk about um, some of the microscopic anatomy when we're looking at the different types of bone. All right, that includes compact bone and spongy bone. So with compact bone, right, we are going to have these functional structural units called osteons. And we talked about those a little bit in chapter five when we were going over the different types of tissue. And so we're going to discuss the osteons, which you're going to see in mature compact bone. You're not going to see it in spongy bone, but you're going to see it in mature compact bone. And so, of course, you're going to see these osteons, these cylindrical structures, they're going to run parallel to the shaft of the bone, to the diaphysis there. So when we're looking at it, you know, it does represent, uh, I, I say it looks similar to a tree trunk, okay? Um, but also some folks have re remarked saying, well, it kind of looks like a bullseye target, you know, with the center bullseye in the middle and then these rings that go around it. So when we're talking about the osteon itself. One of the biggest features of it that people usually notice first is the central canal. And the central canal is just going to be this tunnel-like structure right, that's going to run down the center of our osteon. And it'll be parallel to the osteon. So therefore, it's also going to be parallel to the diaphysis. And that's where we're going to find our blood vessels, right? The, the, the veins and the in the well, the venules, arterioles, and our nerves. Okay, so keep in mind, we mentioned it before, that bone is a highly vascularized tissue, and it's innervated, and so you're going to have nerve fibers there. So when you're looking here at the osteon, you're going to notice that there's these rings that circle around the central canal. And the further away that you move from the central canal, the bigger they get. Oh, what do you want? We call those rings the concentric lamellae. It's just a pizza. And I'll show you a picture here in a moment, okay? But the collagen fibers that are in the concentric lamellae, and that they were produced by the osteoblasts, right, in our osteoid. Really cool phenomenon. The collagen fibers are going to be arranged at 45 degree angles in each concentric lamellae. So when compared to an adjacent lamellae, okay, that angle is now 90 degrees. So if you have a lamellae here, okay, another lamellae internal to that, collagen fibers will run sort of like this. I don't know. Why can't you just pick something? And then the collagen fibers in the next lamellae will run like this. So I don't know what. Take the actual angle to them; it's going to be 90 degrees like that. And this is what gives bone, <laughs> I couldn't even hear. Yeah. Couldn't even hear anything. Um, this is what's gonna give bone, all right? It's strength and resilience, all right? Some of its flexibility, okay, to, um, uh, bending. 
So we talked about it before. If you didn't have a lot of collagen in your osteoid, then you're going to have brittle bones. <clears throat> so of course, right, what helps to make the bone matrix, what helps to create these concentric lamellae are going to be right, osteoblasts. And osteoblasts may lay down the bone matrix. Then we calcify the bone matrix as it hardens with calcium um, and phosphate, the hydroxyapatite. And so once those cells are trapped within the bone matrix, they convert themselves into the osteocytes. And those are the mature bone cells. And their job is to maintain the bone matrix, detect stresses on the bone matrix, and if need be, trigger newborn, new bone formation. And so they live in a studio apartment, right? Are these chambers or spaces called lacuna. And so these lacuna are these studio apartments that have these little black lines that run outwards. And they'll run to an adjacent lacuna. And so what these little black lines are, they're called canuliculi. They're these small channels that go from one lacuna to another, and it allows the osteocytes to interact with one another. And so they can do a number of things. They can exchange nutrients with one another. Okay, they can exchange minerals, respiratory gases, all right, nitrogen, all right, gases, uh, and even cellular waste. And so those nutrients, minerals, and whatnot, especially if it's waste, will get carried to, all right, or towards the central canal where you'll have your veins and they can take away uh, the cell wastes. And then the arteries there that you, you'll see or the arterioles that you'll see that carry the oxygenated blood, they'll bring the nutrients, all right, to the adjacent or close by lacuna. And then those osteocytes will then transfer and share with uh, their neighboring osteocytes. So it's a really kind of a cool system how the canuliculi operate here. So you can kind of see what we're looking at here. Right? When we're looking at our light microscope here, here's the central canal. That's where the blood vessels and the nerves are going to be. All right? And then you can see you have these rings that go around and go around. All right? Those dark spots, those are the lacuna. And inside the lacuna are going to be our osteocytes. And you can see these black lines that uh, project away from the lacuna to neighboring lacuna. And that's the canuliculi. And that's how these cells are able to help each other out. So if we zoom in here in our electron micro, uh, microscope, you can see it really close by. You can see the blood vessels and the nerves on the inside of the central canal there. Right. And then you can see this picture here of the spongy bone. You can see the trabeculae. It's gonna be the scaffolding system or the lattice work. And then that will create these spaces in between the trabeculae and that's where the red bone marrow hangs out. Okay, so we have central canals that run parallel to the diathesis of, of the bone. Well, we've got another type of canal called Volkmann's canals or perforating canals. And what these do is that these canals are perpendicular to the central canals. So the central canals go pretty much up and down. And then our Volkmann or our perforating canals go side to side. So this creates this whole network of tunnels all throughout the bone matrix. And so they allow okay, different osteons right, to connect to one another. So you can see it's a really kind of cool system how this works. Right? If ants lived in our bones, they'd love it because there's lots of places for them to wander around and get around. And so that's what we're seeing here. All right, so we have a, a, two other structures that I want to talk about, the circumferential lamellae and the interstitial lamellae. Circumferential comes from circumference. So the external circumferential lamellae are going to be on the outside of the, of the, of the bone there. Okay but underneath the periosteum. So we'll see it just internally. So these rings pretty much go around the entire circumference of the bone. I'll show you a picture. And then we have the internal circumferential lamellae. And so they're gonna be just internal to the endosteum. Remember the periosteum is the covering to the bone. The endosteum is gonna be the lining. It's that one cell layer, all right? 
that that's going to line the inside of your medullary cavity. But both of these are going to in, in, is, um, encompass the circumference of the bone. Now, when you look at some bone, you'll notice what looks to be like incomplete osteons. And so, of course, during the, the growth process, if there's damage to bone and whatnot, your bone's constantly remodeling itself. So it doesn't necessarily resorb uh, a, an osteon completely. So you'll have some leftover parts and pieces. And those are the interstitial lamellae. All right, so we'll see these interstitial lamellae between existing osteons, all right, and they'll look like these partially absorbed or resorbed osteons. So here, let's take a look. All right, so here's our long bone here. Okay, now we're just gonna take a section of it out. And you can see here, when we're looking at our section of compact bone, all, right, all of this is the compact bone, then you have your spongy or trabecular bone internal to that. So here's an osteon. And so what we're doing is just pulling out all the lamellae here, all right? Each of the uh, consensual uh, lamellae. And you can see it almost looks like a wedding cake. But these black lines are showing you how the collagen fibers are oriented to one another. And you can see how it's 40 to 5 degrees on this lamella, all right? And then it's 45 at the adjacent lamella. So they're 90 degrees to one another. That helps make the bone stronger. All right, so then you'll see you've got your central canal running parallel to the diaphysis. Here are the Volkman canals, the perforating canals, and they go perpendicular. So they'll allow a right, connection between two different central canals. And then you've got your external circumferential lamellae. These go all the way around the bone. And then you've got your internal circumferential lamellae. And so they also will go the entire circumference of the inside of the bone. And then where you can see there's a couple of lamellae that just aren't complete, they look partially resorbed. Those are your interstitial lamellae. And so just a, an, a, a quick review here of the periosteum, that's the covering to the bone. We have our two layers, the outer um, dense or regular connective tissue layer is the fibrous layer. That's the layer that stuff connects to. Then you've got this single thin layer just internal to that, that's the cellular layer. So the periosteum is held on to the compact bone by collagen fibers that we call perforating or Sharpies fibers. And so they all attach right onto the compact bone there. So now in a moment we're here, we're gonna take a quick internal look at our spongy bone here. So here again, you can see, right, we have our osteon, and we're just separating all the concentric lamellae from one another. And it looks like a wedding cake, but you can see the orientation of the collagen fibers here. And then we zoom in, you can see your osteocyte living in the lacuna with its little processes that are coming out. And those processes reside in the cannuliculi. And so they allow these different osteocytes to communicate with one another, share things with one another, exchange things with one another. All right, so the other type of bone is our trabecular bone or spongy bone. Okay, and literally, I'm going to assume that you folks know, right, what a sponge looks like. So you'll see there'll be these like nooks and crannies on the inside here, right? And what separates those little holes from one another is the trabeculae. I call it a scaffolding, all right, but it's this, this lattice arrangement of these different rods and plates throughout the bone. And so in those spaces, that's where you're going to see the red bone marrow and active bone marrow areas there. And this does add to some of the uh, strength of the bone, this trabecula does, okay? Compact bone is the primary type of bone that helps with the strength of the bone, but the spongy bone also contributes to that. So we'll also see some lamellae, which we call parallel lamellae, right, which we'll, I'll show you a picture here in a second. Okay, keep in mind, there's no osteons in spongy bone. That's only in compact bone. So we'll have these parallel lamellae and they'll have 
osteocytes living in lacuna there, and those lacuna will still have cannuliculi right, that we saw before in compact bone. We'll see this also in our spongy bone. Okay, so you can see here we have the parallel lamellae, okay, these different rings here with our osteocytes living in the lacuna. So we zoom in here, here's the osteocytes living in the lacuna with their cannuliculi. And keep in mind, our spongy bone is going to have, right, the endosteum lining it. So on the outside of all these different trabecula, you'll see this thin layer of, of cells similar to the inner cell layer of the periosteum, right? But the endosteum, it's just the cell layer. Here's a nice little osteoclast working away here. All right, everybody, if you have a drink, take a sip out of it. Okay, because we're now going to get into some pretty big concepts here. Tonight, I get to teach you how bones start to form when you're just a fetus. So when you're still living inside your mommy, okay, we're going to talk about how bones start to form. But to do that, I want to talk about cartilage for a brief moment. All right, because remember, your skeletal system has more than just bone connective tissue, right? We have cartilage connective tissue. We're going to have ligaments and tendons and bone marrow. So there's other tissues that are involved. But we're going to start off talking about hyaline cartilage. We briefly spoke about it before, and we learned a little bit about it in uh, chapter five, and we we're going over the tissues. Okay, but your body, when you are developing, okay, is going to make, for, for example, long bones. Your body needs to start off with a cartilage model, all right, before it actually starts to ossify and create bone tissue. So let's start off talking about hyaline cartilage, and then we'll switch over and talk about bone material. So since we are dealing with connective tissue, we're going to have cells and extracellular matrix. And that's what we see in hyaline cartilage. We see the various cells, chondrocytes or chondroblasts, scattered throughout the cartilage matrix. And it's those chondroblasts and chondrocytes that produce, right, the, the, the cartilage matrix, which is going to essentially be protein fibers. In fact, quite a bit of it. It's going to be collagen. Okay. And then also it's going to produce the ground substance. And in this case, our ground substance is going to be made up of proteoglycans and a lot of water. Cartilage has a high percentage of water. That's what allows, it helps to contribute to the flexibility of cartilage compared to bone. But you need to know this, this is very important. In our cartilage matrix, calcium will not be present. Calcium to cartilage is like garlic to Dracula, okay? He doesn't like it, all right? And cartilage does not like calcium. We're gonna be talking about that soon, okay? So once calcium infiltrates or gets into cartilage, it's, it's a death sentence for cartilage. So that's why we don't see it in the cartilaginous matrix there. Okay, so our ground substance is not gonna include calcium, right? Like we saw in bone, the bone matrix, we had calcium and phosphate, okay? And, and some of our other um, bone materials or bone uh, uh, minerals. Okay, so we talked about cartilage and the fact that cartilage is going to be more flexible than bone, right? It won't be as strong. It does have some resiliency, but it is going to definitely have more flexibility. So it makes it a great shock absorber. It makes it great to help reduce friction in certain areas, okay? It can take some compression, like fibrocartilage is wonderful for compressive forces. The issue with cartilage is, okay, in mature cartilage, our cartilage is avascular in mature cartilage, and it does not have nerves. 
So if you damage cartilage, it's not going to bleed. Okay, and it won't even hurt. All right, so mature cartilage is avascular and there are no nerves. So when we're talking about hyaline cartilage, some of the structures that you need to know is going to be the chondral blasts, okay? And they make, remember, B blast, build, okay? They're going to make the cartilage matrix. Chondrocytes are what happen to chondral blasts when they encase themselves or embed themselves into the matrix, right? And what they'll do is they'll ma maintain the matrix. That's their job. Osteocytes maintain the bone matrix. Chondrocytes maintain the cartilage matrix. And they live in their own studio apartment called the lacuna. And so surrounding our hyaline cartilage, we have this covering called perichondrium. Periosteum for bone, perichondrium for cartilage. Made up of dense irregular connective tissue. Now, the perichondrium, right, is similar to the, to the periosteum and yes, that it covers the bone, but a little bit different, it's going to help maintain the shape of the cartilage. Bone doesn't need that because it's so rigid, okay? But our hyaline cartilage does. The perichondrium helps with that. So if you look here at this table here, you can see a little bit of comparison and contrast between bone connective tissue and hyaline cartilage connective tissue. All right, so you both have cells that form the matrix, all right, that are named to, for that tissue, but they both end with blast, okay? So they build the matrix. And then we also have cells that help to maintain the matrix, our mature cells. And those are the site cells, osteocytes for bone, chondrocytes for cartilage. Now notice that we do not have any calcium present in the hyaline cartilage connective tissue matrix. Car calcium will kill that matrix. It's bad. We don't want it. But we do want it in our bone connective tissue matrix. So that's cool. Blood supply, highly vascularized for bone connective tissue. Mature hyaline cartilage is avascular. You need to know those. Commit that to memory. Okay. So now we're going to talk about how cartilage grows like a tree. Okay, as a tree grows, it grows taller. That's one type of growth. And then when it grows thicker, okay, like when the trunk of the tree gets bigger and wider, that's another type of growth. So when cartilage is growing during the period of time that you're an embryo, right, it's gonna grow in length and it's gonna grow in width. So when it grows in length, we call that interstitial growth. And that occurs on the internal regions of the cartilage. Easy to remember, interstitial, internal. Right? But that will contribute to the length growth. The other type of growth is appositional growth. This increases the width of the cartilage and this occurs on the outer edge. Appositional is gonna be on the outer edge of the cartilage much like the trunk of a tree year after year after year gets bigger and thicker and thicker and bigger, okay? That's what appositional growth is. So I'm gonna walk you through, all right, the two types of growth, interstitial growth and appositional growth. So it's story time. So let's start off with step one. You have a chondrocyte. It lives in the cartilage matrix. In one day, it decides to divide, okay? Remember, a chondrocyte lives in a lacuna, which is a one-room one apartment, studio apartment. So now you have this chondrocyte that has decided to divide. So here, step one, it's happy. It's just doing its own thing, maintaining the matrix. And then it decides to divide. It starts to divide. So in step two, now we have two cells living in one lacuna. At this point, they are now called chondral blasts. And you know what blasts do, they build things. So these chondral blasts are going to build the, the cartilage matrix here. But the problem is that's too many people living in that lacuna, or excuse me, too many cells living in that lacuna. It's crowded in there, they don't like it. They wanna have their own studio lacuna. Okay, so they're going to make their own. 
And to do that, what they have to do is they have to keep producing more cartilage matrix, All right? And as they do that, they start to push themselves apart. And so they're gonna keep pushing themselves apart until they each have their own lacuna. And when that happens, when they push themselves apart and they're in their own lacuna, now they're called a chondrocyte. And this is how we get the cartilage matrix to grow internally. So let me go back to the picture here. Here's our microscopic slide. So this is the internal portion of the cartilage and this is the um, outer edge of the cartilage near the perichondrium. So this is interstitial growth. So we see that internally. So here we are. Here's our, um, our chondrocyte. It decides to divide. At that point, it's now called the chondroblast, except it's living in the lacuna with another chondroblast. And that ain't happening. It doesn't like that. So it's going to decide, all right, I'm going to make new matrix. And so they both make new cartilage matrix, and they push away from each other until they have their own individual lacuna. And then when that occurs, they're now back to a chondrocyte. And that's how they've made, all right, the growth of the cartilage to occur internally. So that's interstitial growth, okay? That's the lengthwise growth. That's how a tree gets taller. The other type of growth is the appositional growth. And appositional growth is the width. This is how the trunk of the tree gets thicker and bigger. Okay, so with this type of growth, we're gonna still be uh, dealing with mitotic activity but now we're gonna deal with the mitotic activity of the stem cells, okay? So we have our stem cells that live within the perichondrium. That's that covering to the cartilage, right? And so they'll start to divide. Remember, where you had one cell, now you have two cells. So these stem cells will divide. And so you have one stem cell is gonna remain an undifferentiated stem cell because it's gonna divide again later on. But the other one is now a chondroblast. And so what do chondroblasts do? Build. So what's it going to do? It's going to build new matrix. All right, at the periphery, at the edge of where there's old cartilage. And so what will happen? Well, we saw it before. Okay, the chondroblasts are going to produce that new matrix and they're going to push themselves away from each other. All right, when that happens, they start to live by themselves in their own new lacuna, and then they are chondrocytes. So let's take a look. Pictures help. Okay, so now we're going to look here at the periphery. All right, so in our perichondrium, okay, we have our mesenchymal cells here. That's where all connective tissue comes from anyways, is mesenchyme. So these stem cells will divide, and when they do, one becomes a committed cell and it becomes a committed cell, all right, as a chondroblast. So you'll start to see, here's the older matrix, here's the newer matrix. It occurs at the periphery here. So the older matrix gets pushed downwards or inwards, all right? So now, okay, we have our committed cells right, that came from the mesenchyme cells dividing, and they commit to becoming chondroblasts, and what do they do? They start to secrete right, the um, new matrix there. And what happens? They push away from each other. So you can see these two cells here, all right, those are chondroblasts. They start to secrete new cartilage matrix and they push away. Once they're no longer sharing the same lacuna, right, they are now a chondrocyte, right? And they'll still secrete some of that new matrix there, but they're all by themselves. And that's what they want. That's what any cell wants. It wants to be by itself. All right, so that is interstitial growth and appositional growth of cartilage. So this is what happens when you are an embryo. When you start to take on that human-like form, all right, you're getting ready, right, to start to form a humanoid structure with arms and legs and all that. So we are starting off 
with our cartilaginous growth first. So during the embryological development, both interstitial and appositional growth will occur at the same time. But as cartilage matures, okay, the interstitial growth will slow down quite a bit. All right, so at that point, the appositional growth is going to still continue, and that's going to be the primary type of growth that occurs as the cartilage matures. So once our cartilage has become mature, all right, when it's all grown up, that means, all right, we are going to have two things occur. We're going to become avascular, and we will no longer have nervous innervation there. So again, once that cartilage matures, we will not be forming any new cartilage anymore. The only time we do is if you are injured. Which brings us to one of my favorite topics of this chapter, and that's bone formation, ossification or osteogenesis. You should know both of those, All right? This is how we form bone connective tissue as you are developing during your early development period, right? In mommy, all the way through your childhood, through your teenage years, and possibly into young adulthood, which we call adolescence. So this starts anytime between weeks eight and 12. This is when we're going to start the skeleton formation. So you're going to have your little arms, your little legs, your little feet, your little fingers, little toes, all that. So we start off with cartilage, and then we're going to start to replace that cartilage with bone. And this process will continue, all right, until you reach skeletal maturity which is usually in your 20s. And, and it varies. And some people, they can still grow in their 30s. So when we um, talk about the ossification process, right, that skele skeleton formation, there's two processes that we're going to discuss. Intramembranous ossification, and we're also going to talk about endochondral ossification. Let's start off with the intramembranous there's not as many steps, okay? Keep in mind, it's important that you know when these processes begin, eighth through 12th weeks of development. So the first type of ossification, we'll see this occurs in a lot of our flat bones of the skull, some of our facial bones, your jaw, and for whatever reason, don't ask me why, but the central part of the clavicle undergoes not the whole clavicle in case you're wondering what the clavicle is that's your collarbone so we will call this also dermal ossification it's intramembranous intra within all right so this all occurs within a membrane so there's four steps so i'm going to go step by step so step one we start to see in the in the mesenchyme all right, your stem cells, we start to see these areas of cells start to thicken up. And this will start anywhere between eight to 12 weeks. Okay, usually around week eight, we start to see these globs of thickened tissue. Start, these cells will start to differentiate into our osteoprogenerator cells. And osteoprogenerator cells are gonna give rise to our osteoblasts. Blast build, so the osteoblasts are going to build bone, but they do so by secreting and synthesizing osteoid, our wet cement. So that's what you're seeing here. Okay, step one, we start to get our, what we call our ossification centers where we're gonna to start to form bone. So these little thickened areas, the cells will start to differentiate and we'll get our osteoblasts. And osteoblasts start to produce the osteoid. And so we start to see these 
thickened areas all throughout the mesenchyme. Okay, so step two, our wet cement needs to dry. So that osteoid will start to undergo calcification as calcium salts come in and deposit themselves around the collagen fibers that are found in the osteoid. And we start to get that crystallization or that hardening. And so those osteoblasts now have trapped themselves in that hardened bone matrix. So what do they do? They convert themselves into the osteocytes and they will start to maintain that bone matrix. And that was what we see here. So now all this osteo here, calcium infiltrates and it starts to harden the, those areas up. So these were once osteoblasts, they convert into osteocytes. And then you have these other osteoblasts and they're gonna just keep secreting that osteoid and the same process will keep going. All right, so that brings us to step three. So we're starting to make bone, hooray, it's working, All right? But unfortunately we're making uh, the primary bone also known as woven bone. It's a poorly organized bone, it's very immature. It's not, what, it's not ideal but it's a start, okay? So we have this poorly organized bone that is present and we'll see it this time. So what we saw in the previous step, that's still continuing on. So we're going to see more and more primary woven bone pop up all over the place. Now, as this is occurring, right, we're gonna to start to see the periosteum form. And the periosteum is gonna be on the periphery so the mesenchyme that was on the outer edges of this tissue here is going to start to turn into the periosteum. So we see that in our third step here. All right, so again, osteoblasts keep that same process that was occurring before, laying down more osteoid, calcium hardens it. So all this bone here, it's just poorly organized, it's not terribly strong, but again, it's a start. All right, and then on the outside, on the peripheral edges here, this mesenchyme starts to turn into our periosteum. So you can start to see we're getting these cells that are coming along for the inner cell layer, that sort of thing. And then blood vessels start to migrate into the tissue because there's spaces here. And that's what blood vessels do. Guess what blood vessels do? they bring in more material to make more bone. So it's just propagating this whole process. Now it's kicking up a little bit because now we have blood vessels bringing in all the supplies that we need. We love that. So the last step is step four. That's when our primary bone is going to start to go away and we're remodeling it and we're getting our lamellar bone or our secondary bone. Way better bone, way better. Okay, so now we're going to start to see that the bone on the external edges of this tissue is going to start to become compact bone. Meanwhile, the spongy bone is going to be more internal. So we'll see it like that peanut butter sandwich I was telling you folks about. Okay, the white bread is the compact bone, the spongy bone will be the peanut butter. So we'll start to see the trabeculae form, that little scaffolding or lattice work that's going to occur. There's no medullary cavity for this type of bone formation. So that's what we're seeing here in our last step here, right? When we're talking about our bone, okay? Kicks in high gear. Now we've got a nice periosteum covering. Okay, we've got our inner cell layer. We've got our fibrous uh, layer on the outside here. We've got our um, woven bone has been replaced by the lamellar bone. Compact is gonna be on the periphery. And then in the center or internally, we're gonna have our spongy bone. And here are all the trabeculae and these little spaces here. And eventually we'll get bone marrow in here. Okay, so that's intramembranous ossification. So this is what's going on in baby's skull at around week eight. So now we're going to talk about endochondral ossification. So important that you know this. And in fact, 
this part of our word, chondral, stands for cartilage. So endochondral ossification is going to be basically what happens when we start off with a cartilage model and how it converts over into bone. And that's what happens. So we start off with our highland cartilage model. So pretty much the bones of your extremities, your arms, your legs, your fingers, your toes, right? They're gonna follow this type of process here. Your hips, okay, your, your vertebrae and your spine, and then the ends of the clavicle. All of those bones are gonna undergo endochondral ossification. We're gonna use a long bone for our example. So your book uses the humerus, so I'm gonna stick with it and do the humerus. That's the bone in your arm between your shoulder and your elbow. Okay, so let's start off step one. Easy, we need a model. Okay, so we have our fetal hyaline cartilage model. And we just talked about how we get that model through interstitial growth and appositional growth. So it all starts off with the chondroblasts and they secrete the cartilage matrix, right? And then this again, We'll start off at week eight. So we, we grow our little mini humerus there that is lined with perichondrium. Because remember, the perichondrium is going to help shape our little mini humerus cartilage model. So that's what we're going to see here. Step one's the easiest one, okay? Week eight to 12, here's our little mini humerus here, complete with hyaline cartilage matrix with chondrocytes that are living inside there, and then our perichondria. So that's what we start off with. Easy, step one. Okay, so step two. Remember what I said before about calcium and how uh, cartilage feels about calcium, All right? That's pretty much the same way that Dracula feels about garlic or holy water or crucifixes. Okay, it's bad news. So what will happen is when we're dealing with the cartilage matrix, calcium infiltrates and gets in to our highland cartilage model. And it calcifies the cartilage, makes it hard, dries it out. And during this process, right, on the diathesis of our little bone there, we're gonna to start to form what we call the periosteal bone collar. And so the diathesis of our little cartilage uh, uh, humerus there starts to turn to bone. And we'll talk about that. So here's what happens. So the cartilage starts to calcify. And as it calcifies, it kills off the chondrocytes that live within the matrix because they have no way of getting nutrients anymore. So those cells die. And when they die and degenerate, they leave these holes behind. And so now you have these holes all throughout the matrix, which is good because this allows blood vessels to infiltrate into the cartilage. And with it, they're gonna bring all the supplies that we need to start building bones. So blood vessels start to move into the cartilage, osteoblasts start to move into the cartilage. And what do they do? They build. So they secrete the osteoid and they secrete the osteoid over right, the dead or calcified cartilage matrix. It uses the cartilage matrix as a model, okay? As a mold, so to speak. And so it just starts to lay down the osteoid over the cartilage, calcified cartilage matrix. And so this occurs first in the diaphysis there, in the shaft of the bone. So you start to see this periosteal bone collar start to form. So let's check out our picture here. Here you can see step two. All right, so the cartilage starts to calcify and those chondrocytes die and they leave these holes here. And so the blood vessels infiltrate and they start to move throughout and osteoblasts start to infiltrate and they start to convert, all right, the cartilage matrix 
over to bone. So we see that first here in the diaphysis. Okay, so that is step two. We calcify the cartilage matrix, and then we start to convert it over into bone. Step three. We start off in the diaphysis, so therefore we call that area the primary ossification center. It's the first ossification center, and that occurs in the shaft of the bone. So that periosteal bone collar, that bud, starts to push into the diaphysis there. And as it does so, we'll see the proliferation, the growth of the capillaries and osteoblasts. And now they start to spread out all throughout the inside of the diaphysis there. And so the same type of scenario happens. Osteoblasts come in. They synthesize and secrete the osteoid on top of that old dead calcified cartilage, and it starts as our modeler template. And so it starts in the middle of the diaphysis and it works its way out to the proximal and distal epiphysis. And so it's a rinse and repeat type of scenario. The bone connective tissue, right, is going to replace the calcified cartilage, the dead degenerated calcified cartilage. And so this is going to occur all throughout the diaphysis. So that's what you're seeing here in step three. Okay, the blood vessels have infiltrated all throughout, osteoblasts have infiltrated all throughout. And so we're just gonna work away replacing all that degenerated calcified cartilage and replace it with our new bone matrix. And that right there in the shaft is referred to as the primary ossification center. That's where this process begins. Okay, so all of this is going on before you're even born. Okay, it starts at week eight through 12 and it continues on, right? The whole time that mommy's pregnant with you. Now, step four, this is what you're going to see in a newborn. All right. So we started off with primary ossification. That's great. What about the epiphysis? Okay. That's where we get our secondary ossification. Same exact scenario happens in the epiphysis. Highland cartilage calcifies. When it does so, chondrocytes die. That cartilage matrix degenerates leaves holes there, that allows blood vessels to get in there, that allows our osteoprogenerator cells to infiltrate in there, and then start to produce the osteoblasts, which help to produce the bone matrix. So what we saw in this primary ossification center, we're gonna see in the secondary, uh, in the epiphysi, in the secondary ossification centers, just that it happens a little bit later, okay? But the same type of thing happens. This bone displaces that cartilage. So now while the secondary ossification centers are up and running, right now we got to start to hollow out the diaphysis because we got to start making room for our medullary cavity because our, our spongy bone needs to get in there, all right, on the periphery of the medullary cavity so we can have our bone marrow. So the osteoclasts come into play. We haven't talked about them too much. So our osteoclasts come in and they start to resorb that bone matrix there in the center of the diaphysis, and it starts to hollow out and make that medullary cavity. So that's what we're seeing here, the newborn, okay? The majority here of the, the diaphysis is pretty much now all bone, and now our secondary ossification centers are starting to do their thing. And we're starting to hollow out the center of the diaphysis so we can have our medullary cavity there. Okay, so this is what's going on in the baby. You can even look at this newborn skeleton here. Pretty impressive. All of that by the time of birth, right? And a little bit afterwards, you're going to see all of that as bone. All right, 
That brings us to our last two steps. Step five is basically going to be our mission in step five is to get rid of all of the cartilage in the bone except for two places. You want to keep the cartilage in the epiphyseal growth plates because, well, we want to get taller. Okay, you want to grow. And then we also want to keep the cartilage that are going to be on the ends of the bone in the, our joints, our articular cartilage. But all the other cartilage has got to go. And so that's what happens here. And this is going to continue from the period of time when you're a baby, right, through childhood, through adolescence. So all of that is going to continue on. So that's what we're seeing here. All right, so we've pretty much gotten rid of all the cartilage in the epiphysi, all the cartilage in the diaphysis, okay, except there's two places in our epiphyseal growth plates and where the articular cartilage is. All the cartilage is gone. Okay, and we're still working on that medullary cavity because as the bone gets thicker and longer, we've got to keep remodeling that medullary cavity. So we're going to keep making it bigger and bigger. Okay. So step five, get rid of cartilage, except in those two places. And then eventually you reach your skeletal maturity. That's step six. So once you reach skeletal maturity, you no longer have any lengthwise growth occurring. So those growth plates, the epiphyseal plates, all the cartilage in those epiphyseal plates eventually ossify and go away. And that's when you look at an adult bone and you'll see those epiphyseal lines there. And that just marks the closure of the growth plate. And so this occurs, all right, as late as 25. And like I said, there's some instances where it can continue on into um, the 30s there. Not too often, but there are people that have uh, had that happen. And that's what we see here. So you can see, right, no more growth, epiphyseal growth plates. It's since fused. We still have articular cartilage on the ends of the long bone, right? And then we'll have a nice, well-developed medullary cavity there. So the only cartilage that you should see on an adult bone is going to be the articular cartilage. And that's endochondral ossification. Not too bad. Again. It's a little bit confusing. I suggest to watch the video, go slow, step by step. I like to use the figures here, 711, okay? Go through that, know everything on the, um, on the slide there, and then go into the more detail. So when we talk about bone growth and bone remodeling, this again starts around the eighth week of development. And this is going to go on. The remodeling, all right, is always going to occur, right, up until the day you die, right? But bone length, all right, growth, that's our interstitial growth. That stops when at skeletal maturity around age 25, right? Bone diameter, okay, that is our appositional growth. Diameter is appositional. Bone length or growth of, in length is interstitial. All right, so we just talked about the endochondral ossification and you heard me mention the epiphyseal growth plates. So when we're talking about interstitial growth, growth in length, that's where it occurs at the epiphyseal plate. So we'll see the osteoblasts all right, they'll be on the, we're going to talk about this in a moment. They're going to be on the side of the diaphysis. So cartilage is actually going to start near the epiphysis and then migrate down towards the diaphysis. As it gets closer to the diaphysis, then that cartilage gets converted over into, all right, bone tissue. And so that's why, all right, when this occurs, that whole process is actually going to push the cartilage in the direction of the epiphysis. 
So it's almost like from the center outwards. So let's talk about the epiphyseal plate because I'm going to briefly talk about how you grow longer. All right, so the epiphyseal plate will be active, right, quite a bit in childhood, especially in puberty. Right, and then as you get closer to uh, skeletal maturity, close to your 20s, it will slow down. And it slows down a lot because the rate of cartilage production slows down. And what will happen is we'll see that rate of cartilage production slowing down, but the osteoblasts will actually pick up their activity and overtake the cartilage. And then eventually all that tissue is converted over into bone tissue. So at that point, we no longer have interstitial growth. You will no longer get taller. So I'm going to show you a quick picture here. Here is an epiphyseal plate. Right, and there's five zones. I'll break it down for you. Okay. So you have the zone of resting cartilage. That zone's not doing anything. Then you have the zone of proliferating cartilage. Well, what does it look like there? All right, the cells start to undergo mitosis and they start to divide. And what they'll do is they'll stack themselves up on top of one another like a like a, a like coins stacked on top of one another. And so all, you can see all the lacuna here are just pretty much stacked right on top of one another. Then what will happen in the next zone, we get the zone of hypertrophic cartilage and that's when the cells start to grow and get bigger. And then unfortunately, as soon as they get bigger, all right, now we move into zone four and then they all die. They get calcified. So calcium infiltrates that area calcifies the cartilage matrix that those chondrocytes were working so hard on. And then all of that tissue will eventually degenerate. And then we have our zone of ossification in which we have our capillaries there and our osteoblasts, and they'll convert all of that matrix into bone matrix. So let's put it into words. All right, so the zone of resting cartilage. This is gonna be closest to the epiphysis. Right? This is where we're going to see pretty much nothing going on. Right? We just have all these uh, chondrocytes just hanging out. So they migrate into the second zone and this is where they start to divide. And they divide fast and they divide um, in large amounts. And like this is that row of coins or that stack of coins. They start to line up in these columns all right, on top of one another. Then they migrate into the third zone and they're no longer dividing, but this is where they grow up. And they grow up quite quickly. After that, they migrate into the, uh, the fourth zone. And this is when we calcify the cartilage. This is when the chondrocytes die. This is when holes start to develop. Right, in that cartilage matrix there, which moves us into the last zone, right, in which our capillaries and our osteoprogenerator cells migrate in, and then they start to produce that new bone matrix on top of the degenerated calcified cartilage matrix. So there you have it. That's how you grow longer and taller. So we'll see a lot of activity in zones two and three. All right, that's where we're going to see the biggest gains in interstitial or lengthwise growth. Okay. Which brings me to the last slide for tonight and that is our forensic anthropology. If you've watched the show Bones, I've never seen it, but I'm familiar with it. Okay, that show is based on forensic anthropology. And so what will happen is you'll see, you love that show? Cool, cool. <clears throat> I just started watching uh, a sh a, the show Lucifer. I think that actor is funny. Anyways. Um, yeah, I love Netflix. <laughs> yeah, he cracks me up. 
I just think it's funny that he's running around telling everybody that he's the devil and they don't believe him. Um, so again, basically when we're talking about forensic anthropology, we're basically gonna deal with skeletal remains of somebody. And so we wanna try to identify one, if it's a female or male, and then how old they were. And so what we'll do is we'll take a look primarily at the diaphysis and the epiphysis of several of the bones there. And obviously, if it's a younger skeleton, like a little kid, we'll see a separation between the diaphysis and the epiphysis because it hasn't fused yet. The growth plate was still active. Now, obviously, when we're looking at an adult skeleton, like somebody in their 50s, right, then we won't see that separation. Those bones have fused. So again, it'll help us to determine the age of the person when they passed away. So if it's a complete union, everything is fused, all right, then we can assume, all right, this person's much older. If it's open or partial union, then it kind of tells us, obviously an open union means that there is no connection between the epiphysis, all right, and the bone. Partial, we see some fusion. So again, this all helps us to determine, all right, the age of, uh, of the skeleton, all right? Just the, and there's other methods that, that we use too. Remember, it's just one of the many tools that we have when we're dealing with this stuff. All right, I would like to stop here tonight. On uh, Monday of next week, we'll finish up uh, this chapter and we'll start chapter nine, uh, articulations and joints. So um, let's do that. Do that.